Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level, Biology Unit 3 for January 2024. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1. Vitamin C is a dietary antioxidant. Spinach is a plant that produces edible leaves with a high vitamin C content. Explain the link between dietary antioxidants and the risk of cardiovascular disease. Antioxidants reduce free radicals, and this reduces oxidative stress, which is caused by those free radicals. So this is going to reduce the damage that is caused on the endothelial layer, leading to less chances of plaque formation, and so there will be a reduced risk of CVD. In part B, the vitamin C content of leaves from spinach plants was investigated. Describe how comparative measurements of the vitamin C content of the leaves from two spinach plants could be made. So in this experiment, we have two different types of spinach plants and we want to extract the vitamin C which is contained within those plants or the leaves. And then we have to use a specific standardized method in order to quantify the vitamin C that is present. So I said extract the vitamin C from the leaves using the same extraction method. For all extractions, use the same mass of leaves, same volume of water and grind the leaves with similar intensity to extract as much vitamin C as possible. Then measure equal volumes of DCP-IP solution into test tubes. Then add each spinach extract to a different test tube containing DCP-IP solution and record the volume of the extract used to decolorize the DCP-IP solution. Then use a standard solution of vitamin C. This is a solution of vitamin C whose concentration is known. So you add these to the DCP-IP and record the volume which is required to decolorize. And then you calculate the concentration of vitamin C per sample and compare the results. If you have a test tube containing the DCPAP, then the standard solution of vitamin C whose concentration is known is going to be maybe in a syringe. We have the same volume of DCPAP here as well as here, meaning they have the same number of moles of DCPAP, and therefore we require the same number of moles of vitamin C. So we'll see the volume that has been used to decolorize here, which is going to be volume 1, and the concentration, concentration 1. The product of these has to be equal to the product of these. So when we equate, we can be able to find the concentration of this solution, the unknown extract. So we will do this for both extracts and then compare to find out which one had a higher concentration of vitamin C. And again, for this part, you didn't need to explain it here. You could just have said calculate the concentration of vitamin C per sample. I was just showing you how that concentration could be calculated. In part C, the effect of soil type and season on the vitamin C content of spinach plants was investigated. The table shows some data from spinach grown in the two soil types, in spring and in autumn. So here we see the vitamin C content in the leaves. For spring, we have this with a standard deviation. And then for autumn, we have that with the standard deviations. Of course, these are mean values. The table shows the data required to calculate the missing standard deviation for the spinach grown in soil type 2 in the autumn. So they've given us these values here. Yeah, they say calculate the standard deviation using the data and the formula. So this is the formula we need to use to calculate the standard deviation. I need to calculate the summation of the x minus x bar squared, which is going to be adding up everything here. And I got 0.2. This is for the numerator in the square root. The denominator in the square root is going to be n minus 1. These are 12 data sets, so 12 minus 1 gives me 11. So I came here, square root of 0 0.2 divided by 11. So somebody could round this off to 0 0.13, but because this is a deviation from the mean, I'm going to take the outmost minimum and outmost maximum, so I'll take plus or minus 0 0.14 as my standard deviation. So my answer here was 0 0.14. The graph shows the means from this investigation. Complete this graph by adding the axes, values and labels with the standard deviations. On the vertical axis, we have the mean vitamin C content in milligrams per gram. And on the horizontal axis, we have the different data for spring type 1, spring type 2, autumn type 1 and autumn type 2. So we were required to include the standard deviation. And I'm going to take you back here where we calculated. So the minimum value is going to be 0 0.49 minus 0 0.07, which is 0 0.42. And the maximum is going to be 0 0.49 plus 0 0.07, which is 0 
So I did the same thing for all the other data sets and we can see the ranges I got. This is going to be the minimum and that is the maximum when this is the mean. So from the graph, I have to include this value and that value and show how it deviates from the mean. So I included those values as higher and lower bars and then aligned to connect the two to show the error bars and how they deviate from the mean. Next, I say it was concluded that the vitamin C content of the leaves is affected by the soil type and season in which the plants are grown. Comment on this conclusion. It is true because for type 2 soil, no matter the season, there is greater mean vitamin C content in comparison to type 1. We can see there is overlap between these values and these values, and therefore the difference may not be significant. We also see between the different soil types, there is no overlap between this and that, no overlap between this and that. For the same season in different soil types, there is no overlap and therefore those results are going to be valid. So I said yes because vitamin C content is higher in type 2 soil than type 1. However, there is overlap between the type 2 soil results, so there is no significant difference in the results between the seasons for type 2 soil. Also for the same season but different soil types, the difference is significant because there is no overlap. So this brings us to the end of question 1. Let's continue to question 2. In question 2, all cells are surrounded by a membrane. The photograph shows two animal cells where their membranes meet. Name three types of molecules present in structure A. Because structure A is a cell membrane, we have phospholipids, we have cholesterol, we have proteins, which could be glycoproteins, we also have glycolipids, and so on. In part B, some of the evidence for the structure of the cell membrane comes from studies of permeability. The solubility of substances A to E in olive oil was determined. The permeability of a cell membrane to these five substances was also measured. The graph shows the results. On the vertical axis, we have the permeability of cell membrane, and on the horizontal axis, we have the solubility in olive oil. As the solubility in olive oil increases, there is greater permeability of the cell membrane. If something is more soluble, in the olive oil is going to be more permeable in the cell membrane and that can tell us that the cell membrane has a lipid component. So this explains the results shown in this graph. So I said as solubility in olive oil increases, permeability of the cell membrane also increases. We can see there is a positive correlation. These substances are nonpolar. Substances that are more hydrophobic like E are more permeable through the membrane compared to less hydrophobic ones because substances with greater solubility in olive oil were also more permeable through the membrane. The cell membrane is made up of lipids. In part C, beetroot cells contain a water-soluble pigment. The effect of increasing temperature on the release of this pigment was investigated. The quantity of pigment release was measured using a colorimeter, an instrument that can measure the transmission of light through a colored solution. The transmission of light through the solution decreases as the intensity of the color increases. The results are shown in the graph. On the vertical axis, we have the mean percentage transmission of light, and on the horizontal axis, we have temperature. As the temperature increases, the mean percentage of transmission is going to decrease, meaning less light is going to be transmitted through because there is more leakage of the liquid or the components or the pigments are leaking more, and therefore there is going to be more light absorbed in the calorimeter and there will be less transmitted through. There is greater decrease between 15 and 20 degrees. Error bars have been included. There is some overlap, so the results around this region may not be that different. However, we see here there is no overlap, so those results are going to be significant. So they say, explain the results of this investigation. I said, as the temperature increases, the mean percentage of transmitted light decreases. As the kinetic energy increases, the phospholipids move away from each other more and the membrane becomes more permeable to the pigments. As more pigments are lost, more light is absorbed decreasing the mean percentage of transmitted light. The greatest decrease is between 15 to 20 degrees Celsius and the graph levels off after 20 degrees Celsius because all the pigments have been released. Describe a procedure that could have been used to obtain the results shown in the graph. If you go back to the graph, 
the independent variable is going to be temperature. We're going to vary from 5 degrees to 30 degrees. And then the beetroot is going to leak as we vary the temperature because there is going to be more kinetic energy. The membranes are going to be more permeable. More beetroot pigment is going to leak out. And as it leaks out, there is going to be more light absorbed and less light transmitted. So we'll be able to measure the results using the colorimeter. So I said cut even sized beetroot pieces. Wash them with distilled water to remove all leaking pigments. Use paper towels to pat them dry. Then put equal volumes of distilled water at different temperatures from 5 to 30 degrees into test tubes and place a piece of cut beetroot into the water at each temperature for a suitable time, for example 20 minutes. Remove the liquid and place it into the cuvette and then place the cuvette into a calibrated calorimeter to obtain the percentage transmitted light. Repeat the experiment at each temperature to calculate the mean percentage of transmitted light. Keep each set temperature constant using a water bath. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. In question three, the protein content of food can be estimated using a semi-quantitative method. Name a reagent that can produce a semi-quantitative test for protein. This is burette reagent. Then state the color change that occurs when this reagent is added to each protein solution. The color changes from blue to purple. And next is a semi-quantitative test was used to estimate the protein concentration in a solution. A set of standards was produced using dilutions of egg white containing protein of known concentration. The test was carried out on each standard and on the sample with an unknown protein concentration, which is test tube 6. The photograph shows the results. We see the test tubes from 1 to 6, then the corresponding egg white protein concentration. So they say estimate the protein concentration in the solution in test tube 6. Express your answer as a range. So the concentration of this, based on its intensity, is going to be between this point here. Because this is lighter than that, but this is darker than that. So the unknown concentration should be between 2 to 10 milligram per decimeter cubed. So that was my answer here. And next I say suggest how this investigation could be adapted to increase the accuracy of this estimate. We could repeat the experiment. We could repeat the experiment by varying between 2 to 10. You could do maybe 2 and then do 4 and then do 6 and so on until 10 to see which range this color is going to be closer to. Or we could use a colorimeter in a quantitative method. So I said use smaller intervals of concentration between 2 mg per decimeter cubed to 10 mg per decimeter cubed or use a quantitative method like colorimetry to determine the actual concentration. In part B, some herring are processed to make animal feed. The photograph shows a catch of herring. This process adds acid to the fish followed by heating them for a period of time. The effects of temperature and heating time on the protein content of the animal feed was investigated. The graph shows the protein content after heating for 5 days and 7 days at each temperature. On the vertical axis, we have the protein content of the animal feed as percentage of starting content. And on the horizontal axis, we have the heating temperature. So we can see as the temperature increases, there is a decrease in the protein content of the animal feed as a percentage of starting content. However, we see as the temperature increases, these values come closer to each other. After heating for five days, a gradient is steeper than after heating for seven days. So here they say draw a table to display all the results shown in this graph. So my results are displayed here, but I got them in this way. We can see at temperature 7 degrees, we have 28 and 67 here. At temperature 17, we have 26 and 53. At temperature 27, we have 24, 38. And at temperature 37, we have 20 to 25. So this is how I put them in my table, both after 5 days and after 7 days. And these are the corresponding temperatures. The key thing about presenting results in a table is the independent variable should be on this side. and The dependent variable should be the other side. Then you have to put labels as well as units. Next they say, calculate the gradient of the line at 7 days. Include units in your answer. Because it was a straight line, I just got the difference between that and that and between this and that. So the gradient is going to be 28 minus 22 divided by 7 minus 37, giving me negative 0 
per degree Celsius. And down here, there's a comment on the effect of both heating temperature and the length of time heated on the protein content of the animal feed. Use the graph in your calculation in B2 to support your answer. I've already talked about this. So as temperature increases, the percentage of protein in animal feed decreases both after five and seven days. That's true, we can see from here, they both decrease. And then the rate of protein loss is greater after five days. We can see it's negative 1.4 compared to seven days, which is negative 0 0.2 per degree Celsius. And again, this is talking about a gradient. We saw it was steeper after five days than after seven days. After 37 degrees Celsius, the protein content after five and seven days is almost the same. We saw that here at 37, you can see it's closer. I mean, if the temperature increases, these values are coming to be almost similar. And then heating for seven days caused greater decrease in protein content than heating for five days. And then they say this process preserves the animal feed because it kills bacteria. The process involves heating for a period of time, the heating temperature and the addition of acid. Devise a procedure to safely compare the effect of acid on bacteria. So because they say it's safely, you have to wear gloves and you have to use the septic techniques and make sure you do not culture pathogenic bacteria. So I said, use aseptic techniques like Fleming, sterile forceps, alcohol to wipe tables and wear gloves. Choose bacteria to be tested. Ensure that it's not pathogenic. Prepare a plates with media appropriate for bacterial growth, meaning it should have the right nutrients. Dilute the acid solution to create solutions at different pH, because this is going to be the independent variable. And then cut evenly sized sterile filter papers and soak them into the acid. Use sterile forceps to pick out the soaked filter paper, ensuring that it's not dripping. Then safely place the filter paper onto the inoculated petri dish. You culture for 24 hours and measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition. Repeat the procedure at at least four other pH values. And also repeat at each pH to obtain the mean. This part here is for repeating at other different pH values. But this one is for each pH value you choose, you have to redo so that you obtain the mean. If you cultured in liquid broth, you cannot measure the diameter of inhibition. Here you can dilute the acid and then put the same volume of the acids at different pH into the broth, which is inoculated with the same volume of bacteria, and then culture for the same period of time and measure the turbidity in order to get your results. So this brings us to the end of question three, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.